Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. How do you stop being a victim, take responsibility, and make your life the life you want it to be? In this episode, we uncover the universal principles of success with one of the world's top success experts, Jack Canfield. Are you a fan of the show and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting, and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. That's successpodcast.com. Or if you're on your phone right now, all you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. In our previous episode with former FBI agent Robin Dreek, we heard some incredible stories straight out of a spy novel and then went deep into the six-step system that Robin has outlined to predict people's future behavior, understand what motivates them, and decode human behavior. Now, for our interview with Jack. Jack Canfield, known as America's number one success coach, is the co-author of more than 200 books, including The Success Principles, How to Get from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be, The Success Principles Workbook, and The Chicken Soup for the Soul series, which includes 40 New York Times bestsellers, having sold more than 500 million copies in 47 languages around the world. He holds two Guinness World Record titles and is a member of the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame. Jack, welcome to the Science of Success. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're so excited to have you on the show today. Obviously, you're a a legendary figure in the personal development self-help world, and we can't wait to explore some of the themes and ideas from your new book. Glad to do that. Excited. So I'd love to hear from your perspective, what inspired you to to create the Success Principles Workbook? And and given how much time you spent on this journey and, and how deep you are into the space, what felt right about right now to really bring this to life? Well, let me go back a little bit and and answer another question. First, why did I write the first Success Principles book, which was I realized I was very, very successful. My 11-year-old son said, why do we live in a bigger house than everyone else? (laughs) And I said, well, we have more money. He said, why? And because he knew I grew up poor in West Virginia. And I said, well, because I've been living my life by a certain set of principles. He wanted to know what they were. So we talked about them. And that afternoon, I thought, yeah, I should write a book. You know how these people write books to their kids and say, here's what I want you to know. So I started to write the success principles. Then I realized, I wonder if these principles and activities and strategies I've used are only, you know, idiosyncratic to me, if they're really universal. So I interviewed 75 of the most successful people in North America, people, generals in the military, movie stars, you know, people like uh, Steve Jobs at Apple, CEOs of companies, uh, top salespeople, top podcasters, you know, whoever it was. And basically, I found that these universal principles were universal, that the people that were super successful were all doing similar things. And so I said, well, this is great. I'm going to do the book. So I did that book and it sold, you know, millions and millions of copies all around the world. And I think like now it's up to 47 languages. So one day I'm sitting there and I'm realizing all the people that take my live seminars or that go through our coaching program were performing really, really well. And I met some people who'd read the book and weren't doing as well. And I thought, well, the book's great if you do it, because I got one guy over in the Philippines when I was in Manila, I was at a book signing, and he came up to interview me after the book signing, and he was homeless, literally was couch surfing on all of his friends' couches. And I said, it's a great interview, so why don't you come and be my guest tomorrow at my seminar? So he came to my seminar, I gave him a copy of the book, and I came back to Manila three years later, and. He walks in and he's got a blue blazer on with a big gold medallion on the pocket. And he's got about nine or 10 guys and gals behind him with polo shirts, all with the same medallion. I kind of recognize him. I said, are you John Caleb? He says, yeah. I said, you look different than the last time I was here. He said, I am. He said, I'm now the number one motivational speaker in the Philippines. I'm a multimillionaire. I have three exotic cars. He was wearing two gold Rolexes, one on each arm, gold Doc Martin shoes. I mean, he was really doing it with the bling. And I said, so what happened? He said, I read your book. 
and I did every single thing in it. I said, I don't know anyone has done every single thing in my book because there's like 64 principles at that time. He said, well, I did. And I said, why? He said, well, because here you were, you're living a life, you're happy, you're a multimillionaire, you've got a beautiful wife, your kids are all doing well, you travel all over the world, you're making a big difference. I wanted to do that. And I said, well, if it works for him, maybe it'll work for me. So I did everything you said, and sure enough, here I am. I said, great. So now that's not the norm that people would do that, but he did. But what I realized was something more was needed. And so I said, let's put the all the things that are in our coaching programs and in our live seminars, the activities, the worksheets, the exercises, et cetera, and let's put them between the covers of a book. And so I worked for a year and a half with uh, two of my colleagues and we wrote this workbook. And then I said, well, let's test it with somebody who doesn't know these principles. They'd never gone through the course. They would not read the other book. So we found about 60 people who had not done that. We gave them the book and we said, we just want you to use this book, go through it, gave them about three months to do it. And at the end of it, people had doubled their income, people had lost weight, they had improved relationships, they got out of relationships, they left crappy jobs, they started to do things they'd put off for years, like start their own webinars or write a book. So that's how the book came to be. And I'm really excited about it as we talk. The book, uh, this first two days on Amazon sold out, then they, they were actually, we I think we printed 20,000 copies on the first run. They've now just gone back to print for another 5,000. So I'm excited. It's uh, really taking off. That is awesome. And that story is is so compelling. The journey that really started this podcast was about answering the same question, which is, what are the universal principles of success? And how can we interview experts and find those answers. And and that's a personal passion of mine for years and years and years has been really trying to study people who are extremely successful and figure out what can I learn from them? What can I copy and, and what can I emulate and apply to my own life? No, it's true. And and what is exciting is they are universal. I just wrote a forward to a book that just came out. It was called The Billionaire Secret, written by a guy named Raphael Badzieg published over in, in Europe. He went around the world, took him, I think, three and a half years to achieve just getting to 21 billionaires. It's not easy to get to these guys if you're not somebody, and he wasn't. He interviewed them. Most of them gave him like the better part of a day to interview them. And three of the things they found that I was not surprised, but a little bit surprised, was that of the 21 people, all 21, and they ranged in age from 35 to 81, all 35 of them, yeah, 21 of them, rather, got up at uh, somewhere between 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning. So they're really early starters. You know, guys like Hal Elrod write books like Miracle Morning, What Can You Get Done by 8.30 a.m.? You Need to Meditate and Exercise and all that. So they got up early. They all meditated. Every single one of these people was a meditator. And every single one of them exercised every morning for a minimum of a half an hour, some people for an hour. Even if they had to get up and get into their private jet at 5.30 in the morning to get somewhere, they would get up at 3.30, exercise for an hour before they went out to the hangar and got in their jet. And so I thought that was really fascinating that it showed up. It just keeps showing up in all the books where people interview massive numbers of people. You know, you look at when Tim Ferriss did his books, you know, he started interviewing people, the Titans, uh, I forget the exact title of the book, you probably remember it, but the reality was similar things. And so there are principles that if you apply them, they work. I know Michael Beckwith has this wonderful what he calls the four stages of consciousness, where the first stage is you're a victim. You think the world's doing it to you. You know, you're saying, why God? What did I do? Why do I deserve to be sick or whatever? The second stage he calls the manipulator stage, which is where you realize there are laws of the universe. And if you use those laws, you can manipulate the universe to your advantage, or you can get what you want. You can become prosperous, healthy, wealthy, impactful, make a difference, be significant, et cetera. And then a third stage is you realize, well, if there's all these universal laws, Who's making these laws? Is there some force behind this? And we can call it God, infinite intelligence, source energy, universal wisdom, whatever. And you begin to go, well, maybe I should be paying attention to its guidance. And that's when we start to go inside. Christians would say, not my will, but thy will. People in the New Age would say, following my inner guidance. Other people would say, following my intuition, tuning into my higher self, etc. And then the final stage is where you realize, hey, maybe... There is this universal force, and I'm part of it. Just like one drop of water is not the entire ocean, but it is ocean. The reality is that we all can transform and move up through these stages. And as we go into higher consciousness, we still use the universal laws to manifest that which we're being guided to do. Unfortunately, Matt, as you know, our schools do not teach this stuff. We should all be graduating 
with classes called education of the self or how to be prosperous. Think about kids go to college and they study all this stuff, sociology and science and math and philosophy and history, and nobody's teaching courses on how to be successful. So you get all these kids coming out of college with this massive college debt, not really knowing how to really get rid of it quickly. It's really unfortunate. And I think that's got to change. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the other major reasons that I started this podcast is because I wanted to learn and I wanted to share with other people, what are all the things that they don't teach you in school that are critical to success? Things like emotional intelligence, communication skills, how to negotiate, how to manage yourself, how to motivate yourself, self-awareness, all of these different elements. And yet none of that stuff it may be in some esoteric psychology class, you'll hear the theory about it, but none of that stuff is taught in a way that's actually applicable and applies to achieving your goals and building the life that you ultimately want to live. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always say no one ever got divorced because they didn't memorize the five causes of the civil war or the three exports of Argentina, which is stuff that a lot of us had to learn in school that you don't use very much. And But we all need communication skills. We need values clarification. We need to learn how to manage our emotional states, how to meditate, how to negotiate, how to ask for what we want, how to deal with rejection. You know, and thank God for TED Talks and for YouTube and for all the people that go out into the hotel rooms and put on seminars and people People like you who are bringing people on for the podcast, we're getting this education. But I used to say, if it happens on time, it's called education. If it happens late, it's called therapy. Because a lot of us pay a lot of money to heal the things we never should have gotten in trouble in the first place if we've been adequately taught in school. I remember being in Fairfield, Iowa. I got an award from the university, what was called Maharishi University. That's where they teach TM out in, in Fairfield. I had never been there before. When I went there, and they have a school. It's a K through high school that all the people that are in the TM movement send their kids there to. So I went and visited the school. And it was so cool because early in the morning, right when school started, all these kids, there are hundreds of them at all different ages, sit for 20 minutes of meditation. And I was shocked. You see these little little kids that are like kindergartners and first grade sitting with their legs crossed with their hands folded in their lap. And they're just sitting there with smiles on their faces, talk peacefully. And then I saw the impact of it. I was watching that they were passing from one class to another, you know, during, you know, changing of the periods. And this one boy came up and started teasing this girl. And the girl just looked at him and said, Joe, I know you're just trying to have fun. And I know you, you really got a good sense of humor, but I'm in a really bad mood today. I've really had some difficult things to deal with. So I'd really appreciate it if you didn't tease me today. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry, Andrea. And he walked away. Now, that would not happen in 99% of public schools because they, they wouldn't have the skills to have had that conversation and the consciousness to even entertain it. So I know it's possible. I think, you know, there, there are a number of people that are teaching this stuff. I've now trained 3,500 teachers to teach this work in the public schools and another 3,500 trainers around the world teaching it in public seminars. And so we're, we're slowly shifting this one teacher at a time who teaches other teachers. And it's like a giant chain letter. Eventually, it'll get out there and reach everybody. It's funny that conversation probably couldn't even happen between most adults in America today. <laughs> You're right. And it's because, as, as you touched on earlier, so many people are still stuck in that first phase, that phase of victimhood. Yes, yes. You know, it's interesting. The first chapter in both of my books, The Success Principles and The Success Principles Workbook, it says take 100% responsibility for your life and your results. And I teach this formula in that, in that chapter called E plus R equals O. There's an event, you have a response to that event, and that creates an outcome. And everything you're currently experiencing now is an outcome of how you responded to an earlier event. You know, someone gives you $2,000 bonus, you go to Vegas, you spend it, you have a good time, but a year later, you don't have any increased net worth. Someone else invested it, they have increased net worth. Your wife forgets your birthday and you feel really bummed out and you feel angry or you feel sad or you feel unloved or your wife forgets your birthday and you go, gee, someone who loves me forgot my birthday as opposed to thinking my wife doesn't love me because she forgot my birthday. So you begin to learn that your responses to the event, it's not the event that determines who you are. A lot of people got rich during the recession that started in 2009. A lot of people will make more money during the coronavirus pandemic than they were making before. I have friends who are personal development teachers 
who are up 40% during the month of March and April over where they were last year because of what they're doing. They're bundling products together. They're doing free seminars for people which are building their brand and therefore people are feeling cared about. And then, you know, like Gary Vaynerchuk teaches us jab, jab, left, right hook, right? And so what happens is you give, you give, and then you can sell something. But they got immediately into relationship with people. I have a person I know who runs a gym it's a fitness center. So what happens is the coronavirus pandemic comes along. Everybody gets locked down. They're not allowed to go out. So nobody can come to his, his fitness center. So he could sit at home and say, you know, life is unfair. Why is God doing this to me? I just have invested all this money and all this new equipment and all these trainers. What he did do instead was he meditated. And during his meditation, he had an insight, which was what resources do I still have? I still got all this equipment. People are at home. They were coming in to use the equipment. Why don't I rent the equipment to them? I'll sanitize everything to within an inch of his life. I'll call up all my clients and I'll say, I could deliver a treadmill or a spin bicycle or, you know, an elliptical trainer or some weights or whatever it is that you want to your house. You just pay for the rental. And so now he doesn't get cancellations of his gym memberships. He charges a little more for the rental and the delivery. He sets everything up for them. And he's making more money now than he was making before the pandemic started. A restaurant owner who used to be doing 40 meals a night is now doing 60 meals a night because he immediately bought a thousand takeout boxes, called all his clients and said, we're going to have a menu. There's going to be three items every night, a salad or a soup, a main course and a dessert. There'll be vegetables on the side with the main course. I'll do wine pairings if you want. There's no substitutions. You can either pick it up at 6, 6.30, 7 or 7.30. You come by, call out on your cell phone. You're here. We'll come running out and give it to you. He's making more money, has less staff problems because of social distance in his kitchen. And he's still able to use a couple of his waiters for running and everybody's winning. So the idea is it's not the event, it's how you respond to it. So you're not a victim. You're never a victim. And as Napoleon Hill taught us, in every adversity or heartache, there's a seed of an equal or greater benefit. And so you have to look for it. If you First of all, you believe that's true. And if you believe it's true, then you look for it. And if you look for it, you're going to find it. And then once you find it, you have to put it into action. And so a lot of people are doing very well. A lot of people are shifting how they do their businesses. A lot of people are realizing hey, this is a time I can engage in personal development. I've always told myself I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to exercise. Well, you do now because you're not doing your uh, commute to work every morning. So you do have that time. Such a great insight. And you know, my own response to the, this whole pandemic has been the same thing. I wanna, I've want i been working out every day, taking better care of myself, working harder than I ever have. And it's I want to come out of this stronger in every way than, than when I went into it. And there's no reason you shouldn't. I mean, we all have time now to exercise. I'm actually taking more of my supplements than I've ever taken. I do take a lot. That's why I look as young as I do, as old as I am. I went online, learned about antivirals, what herbs, what essential oils should I be taking, what vitamins should I be upping my doses of, et cetera. So I'm knowing, I'm learning more about just being healthy in general, keeping my immune system high. We know, for example, that when you meditate, it raises your vibration. And when your vibration is high, meaning you're in a state of love, joy, gratitude, compassion, your body is actually has stronger immune system. When you're in fear, your energy goes to your arms and your legs because fear usually meant in the old days that you had to run away from something or fight it or you'd be killed. Now we get afraid of things like losing our apartment, losing our job, our mortgage, you know, not being able to be paid, et cetera. And we can't run or we can't run away from that. We can't fight it. So we're just in stress. And when we're in stress, our immune system goes down because when you were running from a tiger, it didn't matter if you were fighting off virus or bacteria. If you didn't get away from the tiger, your body was going to be eaten. So your body was smart enough to say, let's handle that later. So when you want your immune system to be high, basically when you're in a relaxed state, your immune system has its chance to focus as opposed to being put into shutdown when you're in fear. There's a wonderful, I recommend this to everybody, you go to EFT Universe. EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. That's the tapping technique I'm sure you know about. Dawson Church has this thing called Echo Meditation, ECO, like the ecology, Echo Meditation. And he does about a 10-minute talk on the whole thing about immune system. And one of the things we now know is this meditation he teaches, which is about a 20 minute meditation, and you simply hit the button and it starts and you listen to it and you visualize when you're supposed to and there's some tapping, you tap along and there's some breathing exercises. But he's combined all these three things together and what they did was research before the pandemic started where they had people in a workshop who if they did this every day for seven days in a row, the immunoglobins, which are immunofactors that fight off viruses and bacteria in your saliva, 
increases by 113%. Now, we know that the coronavirus, in order to get into your lungs, has to come through your mouth or your nose. And so what happens is if you're breathing in, whatever you breathe in has to go through your throat, which is where saliva is also lining your throat. So you have a much better chance of killing off that virus before it ever gets into your lungs. So there's things like that we can do that are responses to this event called the coronavirus pandemic, that if we're conscious and we're not hijacked into our amygdala, which is where the fear lives in the back of your brain, then we're in our prefrontal cortex, which is rational thought, creative thought, so we can be rational, do the things, do the research we need to do, buy the products online that we need to buy, and then take the vitamins, do the exercises, et cetera. It's also where your creative mind comes from. To be creative, to actually find ways to be of service, to find ways to stay healthier, to exercise like you're doing, to go online. For instance, you can. I think there's a thing called Pass Class, which you could go, it's an app you can get for free, and there's four thousand free classes that are being delivered on the internet right now. Everything from spin classes to Pilates to yoga to Tony Horton stuff, you know, whatever. And the reality is there's a lot of stuff to do if you're not in fear. And so, uh, as you're saying, you can get healthy, you can get fitter, you can work on yourself, whether you work through my success principles workbook or you work through other things you've always wanted to work through that you've never done. Learn to meditate, practice something you're good at. One of the things I've been teaching, Matt, is called the five M's, which is meditate, mindfulness, which means every hour, you know, set your smartphone to go off every hour so that you stop, scan your body, ask yourself, am I thirsty? Do I need to stretch? Am I in fear? Is my body too tight? Do I need to move and, you know, get up and move around if you need to do a yoga posture, do some breathing exercises, take a quick walk, whatever you need to do, and then come back. So mindfulness and meditation are two of the M's. And then movement. Anytime you're moving, first of all, you're raising your body heat. Heat kills off viruses. That's why our body gives us a fever. Also, if you can get into a sauna or a steam bath or just get into a really hot bath or a really hot shower, that's a good thing to do. It raises your body temperature up. And then movement, dancing. If you love to dance, put on some dance music. There's all kind of like they have these coronavirus playlists where you, there's positive lyrics to keep you high. And also you can dance your heart off. Friends of mine just did a dance party where they hired a DJ they did a Zoom meeting, and they had about 31 people, all with their computers in front of them, standing in front of their computers, dancing. You could see all 31 people in their little squares on the on the thing, plus a professional DJ playing music. And some of them were drinking wine, some tequila, some not drinking at all, whatever. But they had a really great time. So that's another thing you can do. The next thing is called mastery. Anything you're good at, you're going to stay in the present moment, not be in the future in fear, and it's going to raise your vibration. If you love to play the guitar, play the guitar. If you love to play piano, if you love to do puzzles, if you love to listen to TED Talks, you know, whatever it might be, do the things that you're good at, that you love, that raise your energy. And also, if you're getting better at something, so if you're taking a guitar lesson on, I, I study guitar online. There's all these classes. Most of them are free. You can go online and learn new new chords, new riffs, new song patterns, whatever. And I do that every day. It's totally fun. And then the last M is meaningful communication, which is make, stay connected to people and be honest and open. There's not a time to try to impress people about how cool you are, how successful you are, how unafraid you are, et cetera. Just be honest and open, support each other. Don't self-isolate. What's up, everybody? This is Austin Fable, producer and co-host of The Science of Success. This episode of The Science of Success is brought to you by the mobile app Best Fiends. That's Best Friends, but without the R. Best Fiends is honestly one of the best mobile games I've ever played. If you're looking for a truly fun and engaging way to pass the time while enjoying a great story, some awesome visuals, Best Fiends is absolutely for you. Guys, seriously, I'm already on level 120. Beat that. And I've been having so much fun, I'm loving the visual design, the challenging problem solving, and more. And the game is updated each month, so there's always a new look and feel. But see, what I really love is as you progress, the levels require you to think differently and use new tactics to get to the next level. It's really a true what got you here won't get you there kind of scenario, but in the best possible way. Best Fiends also doesn't require you to have Wi-Fi to play, so you can really play anywhere you are. Listen. You gotta check it out. Once you do, email me at austin at successpodcast.com and let's be friends. Now, engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of awesome characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five star rated mobile puzzle game truly is 
a must play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Again, that's Best Fiends. Think best friends, like what we're going to be when you email me when you join the game. But without the R, Fiends, F-I-E-N-D-S. That's Best Fiends. Check it out today. Let me know when you do, and let's play together. Great strategies, and whether or not we're in the midst of a pandemic, I mean, every one of those are things that are easy to implement and and make such a huge difference in your life. I want to come back to this idea of taking responsibility, because to me, that is one of the most fundamental shifts that can really impact whether or not someone is ultimately successful. If For somebody who's stuck in a, a victim mindset, how do you get out of that? How do you start that first step of taking responsibility? Well, you first have to look at, is your life what you want it to be? And if it's not what you want it to be, what I often say to people in my seminars is, how's that working for you? You know, all these things you're doing, you're blaming your mother, you're complaining about your boss, you're making excuses, doing things that are not taking on responsibility. And like, you know, the fact is people are not happy. So if you have everything you want right now, you can probably turn off the podcast and go do something you love to do. But if for something you want, you don't have called more money, more clients, more coaching clients, more customers, more impact better health, more fun time, more recreational time, whatever it might be that you don't have, then these principles work and you've got to get out of victim. And basically the first thing to do is to look at who are you blaming? We blame the government. Look at our government right now. You know, you've got the country blaming Trump for not starting soon enough with the testing. You've got Trump blaming Obama. You've got Trump blaming other people. You've got the Congress blaming the president, the president blaming the Congress, the media blaming the president, the president blaming the media. It's a useless waste of time because if you go to E plus R equals O, that response of blaming is not producing a better outcome. I had a, a, a woman in a seminar, I was just doing an evening workshop for a group. This woman came up on the break and she said, you know, you said you shouldn't be spending your time being resentful to people. I said, well, yeah, it's a waste of time. It's not getting you what you want. Then she said, well, I'm really pissed at my, my father. I said, why? He said, well, he died a few years ago and he left twice as much money to my sister as he left to me. And it's not right. It's not fair. I said, three years ago. I said, yeah. And you're still upset about it. Yeah. I said, and is that making you miserable every day? She said, not a day goes by, I don't think about it. And then when you think about it, how do you feel? I feel I feel terrible. And do you like feeling terrible? No. Does feeling terrible and being upset getting you more money? No. Has your sister offered you more money? No. Do you think she's ever going to give it to you? No. So how is this serving you? What's it doing for you? What's the payoff? You know, and the payoff is you get to be right, but you don't get to be happy. And so what are you pretending not to know? That it's not, it's not going to change. For this to change, you have to change. And so she began began to look at, like, stop resenting your sister. Stop resenting your father. Byron Katie teaches this wonderful process of, like, you know, she has these four questions. Is it true that your father should have left you more money? Well, you'd like to say yes, but can you absolutely know it's true? Well, you don't know. Maybe there's a higher purpose here. Maybe your father was trying to teach you self-resourcefulness. Maybe he was trying to teach you how negative your resentment is and how it hurts you. Maybe there's some other higher purpose you haven't seen yet. Maybe you would have taken that money and bought drugs and killed yourself. Who the hell knows? But the point being that you can't know for sure that this wasn't the way it should have been. Then the question is, who are you when you think that thought? Well, you're miserable. You're angry. You're mad at your father. You're mad at your sister. You're not speaking to her, she told me. Who would you be without that thought? Well, I'd be a loving person. I'd be happy. I'd be talking to my sister. and We'd be having a great relationship. And then, you know, so... Basically, to really get that, it's not serving me to be a victim. It's just keeping me stuck. And I'm going to stay stuck as long as I keep doing what I've been doing. You can go through, in our workbook, we have a set of exercises like, who do you blame for what? Do you blame your boss? Do you blame the traffic for making you late? Do you blame the weather for your moods? Do you blame your your spouse for why you're miserable or your neighbors for why you're not happy? You know, we can go down the list. Wall Street for the recession and you lost your home or whatever. Now, I love this quote from God 10X. What's his name? Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone. I just it just came to me at the same time. Grant Cardone. He talks. I heard him give a talk once. I loved it. He said, you know, how many of you think prices are too high right now? Half the group raised his hand. He said, you know. Uh, you think a steak costs too much, you go out, the wine's too expensive, you go to the store, the good stuff costs too much. He said, is that getting you anywhere? No. 
He said, the only thing that's going to get you what you want is to make more money so you can pay the higher prices. So let's study how to do that. <laughs> so it just makes so much more sense when you think about it. So the other thing you have to give up besides blaming is complaining. Now, complaining is very interesting. Complaining means that I have a reference of something I prefer that's better than what I have. I couldn't complain about gravity. No one complains about gravity. Think about that. You never hear an older person with a walker walking through the hospital or the mall going, I hate gravity. Gravity sucks. If it wasn't for gravity, I wouldn't be all bent over like this. You never hear anyone say that. Why? Because gravity, there's no option if you live on Earth unless you're an astronaut. So we don't complain about things we can't change. People complain about the weather because they know there's better weather somewhere and they're not willing to move to go experience that better weather or get on a plane and at least go for a vacation in the better weather. We complain about our spouses because we know somewhere in our fantasy there's another woman or man who's better. For example, I remember a long time ago when I was first learning about this, I'm a big Super Bowl, you know, NFL football fan. I was watching the Super Bowl and my wife comes in and she goes, I can't believe you're sitting here watching this game, eating Cheetos, drinking a beer, and you're not, you're getting fat and they're all out there. They're making a lot of money and they're healthy. And why, you know, why don't you go in the gym and work out and watch it? I'm thinking, man, I'm complaining about my wife. I come to work on Monday morning. I see Matt and I go, Matt, you wouldn't believe my wife. She's a food Nazi. She's a real pain in the butt. Now, in order for me to do that, I have to know or pretend that somewhere in the universe, there's another woman that would go, honey, would you like some more nachos? Can I get you another beer? And now there are women who do that. So knowing that I can complain about my wife. But here's the problem. Complaining about her is not going to get me what I want. Either I have to have a negotiation with my wife, which is called, let me alone. This is my body. I'll do what I want. Or I need to go to therapy and work on our relationship. Or I need to stop drinking beer and eating Cheetos, which is probably a good thing. Or I need to get out of the relationship and go find a woman who's going to deliver the nachos and a beer without a fight. All three of those things require me to take a risk require me to do something different, to step out of my normal comfort zone. And so I'd rather complain about it than do the thing that would get me what I want. There's an exercise in a book that says, what are the things you complain about? What would you rather have? How could you get it? When will you take the action to do that? And so you begin to look at, okay, if I want to get out of being a victim, these are things I have to do. And then a third one is excuse making. We all make excuses after the fact, why we didn't get the report done on time, why we're late to work. If you were to take one of my live seminars, which I hope someday we'll be able to do again, on the front of the stage would be two fish bowls on either side of the stage. If anyone in the group complained, blamed, or made an excuse about why they were late or why their phone went off, because we have a rule, you, if your phone goes off in the training, it's a $20 fine on the spot. You start to make an excuse about it, it's another $2 fine. And we're not trying to punish people, but make them aware that there is a cost when you play the victim game. These are some of the ways you can begin to do it. Like in our house and in my company, if someone makes an excuse, blames somebody or complains about something, my staff or my family would have to put $2 in a jar. Again, it all goes to charity. We're not trying to punish them, but make them aware that there's a cost to you much bigger than the $2. Such great exercises and, and really practical, applicable ways. I love the question coming back to blame is just asking yourself, who are you blaming for for what in your life? And I mean, all three of those things, blame, excuses, and, and complaining are so dangerous and so insidious and can really easily sabotage any attempt to be successful at, at anything you want in life. And you know what's interesting too is that you could give me any situation that some people blame for their failure the fact that their parents were alcoholics, that their husband was abusive, that they were born black, lesbian, female in Alabama, you know, which I wouldn't want, wish on anybody. I have a gay son, so it's not about the gay part, but about, you know, just the prejudice they would face in that situation. The reality is that there's somebody who was born in that same situation who did well. You take two twins, one becomes a successful person, the other becomes a drug addict. And they both were the same DNA, grew up in the same household, went to the same schools, etc. But one made a different set of choices based on their response to the world they were in. One did well, one did not. And we can see that there's lots of twin studies out there that, that you know you can do research on. And I think that I've had people embezzle money from me. I've had people do lo wrongful lawsuits that we just settled rather than go to court because it was cheaper, but we weren't guilty. And I, I could complain about a lot of stuff along the way, people plagiarizing my work, people you know, stealing our copyrights. And uh, in Iran, for instance, someone published about 20 Chicken Soup for the Soul books and never paid us royalties because Iran doesn't honor international copyright law. I've spoken in Iran about three years ago. I went over there and 
book in Tehran, had to go through the Pakistani embassy just to get a visa since we consider them an enemy. And But anyway, it was cool. And this guy comes up to me and he hands me $10,000 in crisp $100 US bills. And I said, what's this for? He said, well, we've been pirating your books for the last 10 years. I just started to feel guilty about it. Here's a little bit of royalty money anyway. <laughs> it was kind of cool. But the idea is all these things can happen to you. And so it's just what is. So what? Get on with your life. That's a really funny anecdote. And, you know, something you said a minute ago, too, really resonated with me, which is this idea that doing the thing that ultimately gets you what you want requires you to take risk. And so often that risk part is really what can end up paralyzing you or or making you scared or preventing you from really ultimately taking action. Well, you know, one of the Another formula I talk about is awareness plus risk equals success. In other words, you cannot get change if you keep doing the same thing you've been doing. Everyone listening to this right now, just fold your hands. And with your hands folded, notice which thumb is on top. It's either your left or your right. Now, I want you to unfold your hands and move all your fingers up a notch so the other thumb ends up on top. Don't just move your thumbs, but move all the fingers so the other thumb ends up naturally on top. And notice how that feels. Now, when I do that with audiences, I'll ask how many of you have noticed that that feels uncomfortable, awkward, or strange, or weird, and almost everyone raises their hand. And I'll say, what do you want to do? And they'll say, I want to go back to the other way because it's so uncomfortable. So they go back to the other way. And you can do that now. Unfold your hands, put them back to the original position. And most people go, ah, it's kind of a sigh of relief. And this is why most people are not successful. They'd rather be comfortable then do what's necessary because all new behavior, just neurologically, the way the brain is wired, is going to be uncomfortable. Just as simple as changing our the way we folded our hands felt awkward or uncomfortable. But here's the cool part. If you were to, and you can do this today if you want, fold your hands in the wrong way, maybe while you're watching a TV show or something, and notice that after a few minutes, it doesn't feel weird or awkward or uncomfortable anymore. Your body adjusts, just like we all learn to drive a car. It was awkward at first, especially if you were learning with a stick shift. Now we can do it, you know, any respectable person can drive with one hand on the steering wheel, break up a fight with the kids in the back seat with the other hand, you know, or have a Big Mac in your right hand or whatever it is you eat when you're in your car. The reality is it's just a matter of being willing to be uncomfortable a little bit so that you get to where you wanna go. And so you first have to fight off the discomfort concept. The second part is the fact that there is a potential risk of loss, loss of time, loss of invested money, loss of face if you don't succeed, loss of self-esteem if you judge yourself by your successes, which you shouldn't, but many people do. The, the fact is, I teach this idea about asking for what you want. A lot of people are afraid to ask. You know, to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be willing to ask. And you have to be willing to ask big. Most people don't know this, but Howard Schultz, who started Starbucks, was turned down by 217 banks for investments before he was able to get an investor to invest enough money that he could open his first Starbucks store. So think about this. If he'd given up or he was afraid to ask or afraid of rejection, if he'd given up after 200, we wouldn't be all knowing who Starbucks is and most of us getting our coffee there when we go out in the world. So the reality is that you've got to be willing to take some risk. But the fact is, most risks are not nearly as big as you think they are. If I ask someone out to dinner and they say no, I didn't have anyone to eat dinner with before I asked them. I don't have anyone to eat dinner with after I asked them. If I ask, and my life didn't get worse. If I ask someone to invest in my company and they say no, I still don't have any money, but I didn't get worse. I was working at a company called Solar Optical Company as I came in to do a keynote speech for their sales team. And 300 people in the audience. And I asked them if they knew who the top four salespeople were. And I'd heard that these top four were outperforming everyone, like by 100, 200, 300, 400 percent. And they all said, yeah. And I said, yell out their names. Same names came out. I said, how many of you have ever gone up to them and asked them, what is it that you're doing that I could learn to do so I could be more successful? And not one hand went up. And then I said, why don't you ask them? And then they yelled out, fear of rejection. They might say no. I said, we well, already have a no. How could it get worse? And it can't, you know, so basically we have to be willing to take risks. And as Tony Robbins says, you know, massive action produces massive results. So the bigger risk you're willing to take, you don't want to take a risk that's going to take you out, meaning risk should be rational. You know, you don't want to risk all your money. You don't want to risk your entire company, your house, that kind of thing. But, you know, if you look at, I was watching uh, one of these celebrity chefs being interviewed. I was in Singapore you know, watching CNN just to hear some English. <laughs> and I was, they were interviewing one of these master chefs. Can't think of his name right now, but it doesn't matter. And he was saying, you know, in order to 
build my first restaurant, I had to sell my first house. Now, that was a, that's a huge risk if your restaurant doesn't work. But he was willing to take that risk. And now he has restaurants all around the world, several of which I've eaten. And I just can't remember his name right now. And he also had his own TV show. You got to take risks in order to go to the next level. Invest money, whether it's in your own company, the stock market, a, a friend's business, whatever it might be. You have to risk. The first time I ran a training, I put the wrong exercise at the very end on a Sunday afternoon. And it just got people way too emotionally stimulated and half the people left kind of raw. And I realized better do that on Saturday. But I never would have known that if I hadn't done the workshop. So you just have to put something out there. Microsoft, if we waited till Microsoft programs were perfect, there'd be no Microsoft programs. That's why when we're working on our word processor or whatever, you know, we're processing, typing in Word documents, Sometimes it'll crash and they'll say, should we send this error to Microsoft? Well, they expect that to happen because the programming is going to have bugs in it. And so we have to be willing to to make mistakes in order to learn. And it's okay. Think about how many times you fell down before you learned to walk. If your parents had given up after, like, you got 200 times to fall down. After that, you're on your own. <laughs> we, most of us never were to learn to, to walk. So give yourself permission to fail and know that failure is part of the process. Many of uh, you've probably heard people say, fail faster. The faster we fail, the faster we learn, the faster we're going to get to where we go. So many nuggets of wisdom in there. This episode of The Science of Success is brought to you once again by our incredible sponsors at Brilliant. Go to www.brilliant.org slash science of success to learn more. For a limited time, the first 200 of our listeners to sign up get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Brilliant is a math and science learning platform, and their mission is to inspire and develop people to achieve their goals in STEM learning. I love it. The courses Brilliant offer explore the laws that shape our world and elevate math and science from something to be feared to a delightful experience. What I love about Brilliant is that they make all this learning so fun and interactive with puzzles that feel like games but have tremendous teaching and value with them. Brilliant offers a wide range of content like interactive courses on topics from mathematics to quantitative finance, scientific thinking, all the way to programming. On our show, we dig into the importance of learning how to learn and building frameworks for problem solving. That's why I can't think of a better sponsor for our show than Brilliant because they help you do just that. Go check them out today. Brilliant is giving away 20% off their premium annual subscription to our first 200 listeners to go to www.brilliant.org slash science of success. Go today and get started. Again, that's www.brilliant.org slash science of success. One of my favorite things that you just shared is this it's such a simple idea but it's really powerful which is if you if you don't ask or if you never ask then you already are guaranteed to get a no in almost every case maybe barring a little bit of embarrassment or, or fear of rejection there's really only upside to asking absolutely you know one of the exercises i do in my live training is called the nine no's exercise and i tell people you know how many of you are afraid of rejection about half the hands go up and i say we're gonna do an exercise to get you over that so i said what you're gonna do is think of three things you could ask for that would help you achieve your breakthrough goal so a little background one of the things i have in the book the success principles workbook is to create a breakthrough goal what would be a goal that if you achieved it in the next year so it's a one-year goal it would quantum leap you in terms of the success of your life, your profession, or your company. For most people, it's something like, you know, write a book, double my income, get Uber as a client, have my own radio show. I had a chiropractor who had his own radio show now in Texas after he took this exercise in a seminar I did. And he got a five-minute radio show during drive time where he would talk about subluxations, he would talk about nutrition, he would talk about meditation, herbs, vitamins, all this kind of stuff. And every morning, somewhere between seven and nine, he would have this little five-minute show and pretty soon all these people started coming to him and calling him and wanting him to be their chiropractor. In two years, he now opened four satellite offices 
He goes to each office one day of the week, Monday through Friday, hired other chiropractors coming out of Parker Chiropractic School down in Texas. And now he's making a multi-million dollar a year income, whereas before he was making maybe about $80,000 a year. So that one little breakthrough goal of having his five-minute radio show on local radio totally quantum leaped him. So this is, what would be someone who would quantum leap you? Now, once you have that goal, we said for the nine nose exercise, what are three things you could ask for? Think of three people you could ask, practical. You know, will you babysit my kid every Saturday afternoon so I can write my book? Will you, you know, lend me $1,000 so I can go take this online marketing class? Whatever it might be. And I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to mill around and you're going to go up to people and you're going to ask them for what you want. And they're going to ask you for what they want. And you're going to say no to them and they're going to say no to you. But you're going to count how many times you say no to different people. So you come up, Matt, you ask me for something, I say no. You ask me for something... And I say, no, I ask you, you say no. Now we separate, we go to someone else. You ask them for something, they ask you for something. You count how many times you give a no. The 10th person that asks you, you say yes. Now what happens is, as we do this, people start getting yeses. And by the end of the exercise, I let it go on for about 17 minutes. At the end of the exercise, almost everyone's got a yes. Some people have got five yeses. And I say, what did we learn from this? And people go, oh, it's simply a numbers game. The more people I ask, the more likely I, I, I can get a yes. It's called the law of probabilities. The more people you ask, the more chances of getting a yes. The more books you read, the more likely one of them will change your life. The more seminars you go to, the more likely one of them will make you a millionaire, et cetera. So the law of probabilities. So the other thing is they go, their no wasn't personal. They weren't able to give me a yes. I was taking it personal, like they didn't like me. Well, no, they did. They weren't in a position to give a yes. And that's true in the real world. The other thing some people realize is you can stand in front of one person and go, will you give me a million dollars? No. Will you give me a million dollars? No. Will you give me a million dollars? No. Will you give me a million? The kids know this. They ask their parents, mom, can I have a cookie? No. Mom, can I please have a cookie? No. Come on, mom, give me a cookie. No, you'll ruin your appetite. Mom, I promise I'll eat everything you put on my plate, even the broccoli. No. Mom, my blood sugar is low. I'm going to fall over and faint. You don't want a child fainting on the floor, do you? And eventually you give in, you go, oh, here, have a darn cookie, you know? So you can go back to people because, for instance, maybe you went to your brother a couple of weeks ago and you asked him to join your multi-level marketing company. He says no. But now that he just lost his job because of the pandemic, he says, yes, you don't. So you never know what situation changes for people. So I teach ask, 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 ask. And I coined a term. It's become part of the language. But about five years ago, I said, we should all learn to become ask holes. So you just ask, 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 ask. That's so funny. You know, I've got a I've got a two year old and she'll just sit at the kitchen counter and just say cookie, 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 just over and over. <laughs> again. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I have a dog that does that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But persistence, I mean, it really, it makes yeah. a big difference. And yeah. I mean, this this whole discussion reminds me of one of my all-time favorite quotes, which it put a smile on my face to see. It was actually one of the chapter titles in the, in the book was, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Yes. Yes, it's true. And we're so afraid, as you said earlier, we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of failure. We're afraid of loss. We're, many people are afraid of success. What happens if I win the lottery? All my relatives are going to come out of the woodwork and they're going to want money from me and I'm not good at saying no. And then people are going to owe me money and, you know, whatever it is, there's a fear. Some people are afraid if they have money, they'll become unspiritual. You know, there's a lot of subconscious beliefs and fears that, that run us. But I love Tony Robbins has this quote, if you can't, you must. That's why he's always having people walk on fire and jump out of planes and things like that. Because... I remember the first time I did a firewalk, I was there and, and I, I got to the other end of it. And that's not a very useful skill unless you run a lot of barbecues, you know. But the, the thing for me was I got to the other end of the fire and I, went, I said, what else have I told myself I can't do? I must have made like 40 scary phone calls the next week, you know, but I've been putting off because I realized there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, it's just our mind telling us that something bad's going to happen. In the workbook, we have a whole chapter of like, how do you scare yourself? What are the negative outcomes you imagine? What are you telling yourself? See, one of the exercises, I scare myself by imagining. So you think of a fear you have. Well, I'm afraid to jump out of a plane. 
well, I'd like to jump out of a plane. That'd be really cool. Great adrenaline rush. Get to like have that picture on my wall, prove I'm really cool. If I'm a success teacher, you know, it's another merit badge on my, on my sash kind of thing. And I scare myself by imagining that if I do, for some reason, my chute won't open and I'll go splat and die. I'd really like to ask my boss for a raise. And I scare myself by imagining that if I do, not only will he not give me a raise, he'll probably tell me what he's upset with and he might even fire me. So people are doing this stuff to themselves all day long, but they're unaware that they're doing. They're not conscious. Conscious. Basically, you want to realize what am I doing? And then I have a little mantra I teach people. And I, in my seminars, I have a lot of fun with it. I say, I learned this mantra from a teacher in India and, and all this kind of stuff. And I have people put their finger and their thumb together and I have them chant, oh, and then we add, what the heck? Go for it anyway. And I'll have, I'll have like, you know, 400 people chanting that for the next minute or so. Everyone laughs because it's funny. But really what I want them to get is when you're feeling fear, just say to yourself, oh, what the heck, go for it anyway. The worst that can happen is, is usually nothing very bad. Obviously, you know, think about how you're scaring yourself and then let it go and just just do it. That's the main thing, you know, and, and I think Brian Tracy said the only question people ever ask once they do the thing they're afraid of is why didn't I do this sooner? Why didn't I do this sooner? Because you realize you could have had that money, that person in your life as a relationship, that date that you wanted, that loan that you wanted, that podcast that you wanted to be on, whatever it is. Nine times out of 10, it works out really well. And at times it doesn't, you learn something so you can go back and do it again more intelligently. You know, one of the things you said at the very beginning of our conversation was that if you read books, great, but if you don't act on it and you don't implement it and execute on it, then it ultimately doesn't matter. And that's why I think it's such a great idea to put together a, a workbook. And I love all these exercises and these questions. I'm writing them all down. I'm going to use them all. I'm curious, what would be one out, out of all the things or exercises we've talked about, which one would you recommend if the audience wanted to start with one of these, which one would you say would be the most impactful place to start? Well, let me give a context to that. I'll answer your question, but the context is if I asked you if you could only keep one organ in your body, which one would it be? Fair enough. And you'd say, you know, you can't do that, right? Your body will die if you don't have your lungs and your heart and your kidney and your liver and your stomach and so forth. What I've done in the book is taken 17 of the core principles from the bigger book, which has 64, and said, these are the core things. If you do this in order, it is like a combination lock. It's the right thing to do. And like you said, it's not a book you read. It's a book you do. In fact, I wish I'd written in the first. I almost wish I'd renamed the book. Don't read this book. Because I really don't want people to read the book. I want them to do the book. And so literally each exercise you do in the order that you do it takes you through this combination lock where you get to the end of it. You've actually transformed your life. You have a plan of action. You're doing things differently. You've overcome a lot of your fears. You're visualizing. You're affirming. You know what your breakthrough goal is. You're asking for feedback, which a lot of people don't because they're afraid of what they're going to hear, which is another big fear, et cetera. So with all that having been said, I would say that probably it's it's the one you haven't done. If you haven't set goals, you know, you've got to have goals for your life. So you got to sit down and have specific measurable goals. If you're not visualizing, you need to be visualizing every single day and doing it correctly. But I would say probably number seven, which says take action. That gets to where we talked about, you know, it's not enough to know these things. You have to take action to fulfill your goal, to achieve your vision, to fulfill your purpose, etc. And so I teach something in the book called the rule of five. Once you have your breakthrough goal or your your goals in seven areas of your life, which we also take you through, the seven areas of health and fitness, relationships, finances, a job and career possessions you want to own, things you want to do, philanthropy, et cetera. Then the idea of five things a day on your main goal. So you pick what's the most important goal you have. And you say, if I were to do five things today that would move me toward that goal, what would they be? And you write that down and you don't go to bed until they're done. And sometimes I've been up till two in the morning to complete that list of five. Now, normally I don't because I plan more intelligently than I did when I first started. But the idea is if you do five things a day, it would be like going to the largest tree you've ever seen with an ax, very sharp ax. If you took five cuts at that tree every day, eventually even the tallest redwood in the redwood forest would have to fall down. So if you take five actions a day, you're going to do like 1,800 plus actions a year to 
achieve your goal. There's no goal that you can't achieve if you were to do that. And the actions you take could be some of the things in the book that you haven't done yet, or they can be actions like making five sales calls. When we did Chicken Soup for the Soul, we took five actions every day. And as a result of that, in 14 months, we got to number one in the New York Times list and we stayed there for three years. And we had a book on the New York Times list every week for seven years because of this rule of five. That's incredible and such a great and simple yet powerful tool. Jack, for for listeners who want to be able to find the workbook and all of your work online, what is the best place for them to find that? There's several best places, but the best place to go is thesuccessprinciplesworkbook.com forward slash order. And you'll go there and you can order the book once you get there, either through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. But you'll get a bonus, which is an hour and a half seminar I did called a Success Principles Masterclass, which we recorded for about 2000 people a couple of weeks ago. You'll be able to download that and listen to that. So it uh, really takes you through these principles in a much more logical, sequential way than we did here on the interview. Also, you'll be able to download the first chapter of the book digitally before you get it from any of those book dealers. And and if it's uh, Amazon sold out the first two days and they're restocking. So by the time you hear this, they may be in. If, you, if it says out of stock, then go to Barnes and Noble, order it there. Or you can order it and wait for it if you're not in a hurry. I would be in a hurry to get this and order it from Barnes and Noble or Books a Million and get the bonuses. Well, Jack, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing your story and all of this wisdom, a fantastic conversation and so many practical and actionable insights. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.